Oh. Ah. <laughs> Good morning, LBC Radio. This is Corey Rosen with the Story Podcast. Today I have on a special guest, Miss Sarah Ziegler. Originally from San Diego, California, Sarah Ziegler is looking forward to finishing her BA in music with a focus in viola and education and getting more involved in the Lancaster's music local music scene. Oh my goodness. Well, You're good. You got it. <laughs> well, a committed and proud violist, Sarah also enjoys dabbling in cello, guitar, mallet percussion, upright bass, violin, and ukulele too. She can usually be found reading, writing, knitting, practicing, spending time with friends, learning American Sign Language, and researching psychology and other topics that catch her interest. From Baroque to modern improv, Sarah loves sharing music with those around her and never feels more content than when a group of people are gathered around the shared joy of music. You can find her at her website that at all four as in the number, one as in the word, strings dot udo? O D O O. I don't O-D-O-O know how you say it. Com? Yeah. Well, how are you doing today, Sarah? I'm doing well. How are you? I'm doing pretty good. Oh, thank you for having me. Sorry I gave you such a mouthful to read there. No, I, listen, there are some people who give me a novel to read, <laughs> but it's totally fine. So what yeah. inspired you as a, as a child to get into music and especially like playing an instrument? Yeah. Um, so I got started a little bit later in the game. I lived in a small military town, and so I took piano from when I was seven to when I was about 10, and then... My teacher got stationed somewhere else, so she left, and I mm. didn't take any music lessons again until I was 12 um, when we kind of – I was starting middle school, and we had me just try different, like, fields. So I was in my first play then, and I started violin lessons. Um, I actually was not inspired to pursue music um, until really close to coming to college, actually, though. Mm. So – Yeah, I needed to take a break from violin when I was about 15, just with some health stuff going on. Um, Picked up viola when I was 18, and then auditioned for this music department a year later, got accepted, came in. So there's quite a bit of a journey to get me there. (laughs) So your piano lessons, was that just a thing that you were just, all right, you're, you're doing piano lessons now, or is that something you wanted to do? I think it was just something my brother and I did because our parents said, okay, we're giving you guys piano lessons. I mean, my mom had grown up learning music and everything, so it was just kind of assumed. But gotcha. Yeah. So <clears throat> what made you choose viola? Yeah, so it's kind of funny. My mom still has a picture of tiny little, like, two-year-old me looking at her viola for the very first time, and I'm just entranced by it. Um, And... I think when I was like eight or nine years old, I walk into the room and I told my mom, mom, I'm going to major in viola. She was like, Sarah, that's ridiculous. You've never touched a viola. (laughs) And I mean, again, so I picked up violin at 12. um, And then as I was, I graduated from high school in December. So I still had an extra semester just kind of free to do whatever I wanted. How'd you do that? Yeah, so I was homeschooled and I overachieved the first three years. (laughs) So I had like two classes senior year that I had to take because I had taken everything else already. Um, So I had one extra semester and a summer and I kind of had to decide what do I want to really learn more about and invest in more. And I was like, okay, I want to pick back up violin, but I'd really love to learn how to play viola. I was like, let me try my hand at alto clef. I mean, that's the main <laughs> thing that makes it hard. And mm-hmm. I know string instruments, and there's a much bigger need probably for violists just in string quartets and orchestras. And so I thought that would be really fun to try. So yeah, yeah, it, it's um, it's I, you're the only violist I know. <laughs> nice. <laughs> That's amazing. I was going to say, well, I know others, but I guess as a violist, as I would, would hope know. I know others. In the part but... of the orchestra, too. I know there's some violists in the o- orchestra, right? Yeah, yeah. But we finally have one other um, violist who's participated in some of the ensembles. She's not an MWPA major, but Kristen oh, wow. Webster. She's a she was a freshman last really? year. 
Yes, I love that girl. She's amazing. So cool. I got my my viola homie. But <laughs> I know there aren't a lot of us though. Yeah. So what made you choose LBC from all the way in San Diego? Yeah, that's a very good question. <laughs> um, we heard about the Lancaster area mostly through Sight and Sound. I love mm. theater growing up. Did every show I could possibly do. Um, and so. Some friends told us about Sight and Sound. My grandma lives in Delaware. So when we were visiting oh. her, we decided to bring her down and check out Lancaster, see a Sight and Sound show. We fell in love with Lancaster. Oh my gosh. I was like, is this home? Like, mm -hmm. I love this. This is amazing. Um, I was an extreme homebody, terrified of the idea of leaving home. And so my parents were like, why don't you just move across the country? <laughs> and if you hate it, We'll bring you home, even if it's after, like, two weeks. And you're like, that's it. Get me out of here. Like, we'll take you back, but just see how far you can go and if you like it, um, which is a really good a really good mindset for me because I felt like I had an out whenever I needed one. Mm. But, oh, my gosh, I love LBC. I mean, here I am four years later, and <laughs> I adore it. It's home. So, yeah, we kind of find out, found out about Sight and Sound, found out about LBC through Sight and Sound, they offered a really great gap year program, and I wasn't sure what I wanted to do at that point. So I ended up at the gap year program, auditioned for the music department, got in, and God was really setting on my heart, like, no, music is what I have for you to do. And mm -hmm. so here I am. So what was, so it's one life you're talking about, yes, right? Yes, yeah, one what life. What is that like? Yeah, it's I've crazy. Heard, I've, heard, yeah, I've heard multiple <laughs> things about one life. One life is awesome, and it's very intense. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um. It's focused around experimental, experiential learning, excuse me, service and travel. I love the experiences I got there. There's really heavy, intense discipleship happening between the mentors and us. Um, and so, oh my word, you dissect who you are as a person. <laughs> you get your whole idea of the gospel completely shaken and turned upside down of, um, in place of, so we took Bible credits in one life. So I took like Christian narratives. LBC students will be familiar with that. Um, Bib Herm or interpreting mm -hmm. the Bible, I think it is now. Um, oh, really? Yeah, I they're know. Like, I like hermeneutics is such a hard word. Can't they're like, be, yeah, yeah gotta, let's not do hermeneutics. Yep. <laughs> yeah, I think they changed it. So, you know, whatever it is now, we took that. Um, and oh my gosh, Christian narrative. So with experiential learning, you're only in the classroom five days for any one class and then you take another one or two weeks seeing what that looks like in real life which was so mm. cool so christian narrative one we were introduced to the concept of creation fall redemption restoration mm. um which is just a really simple guideline for like understanding the, the whole Bible's biblical story yep. yeah um and then so we learned that in five days and i mean oh my gosh just seeing our speaker dave bindewald he was awesome he was like you think you know the gospel but we are going to dive into scripture and like really see what it's like and i experienced but the bible's power in such a crazy way like from that class and then the next week we went and saw all kinds of different um jobs kind of unique jobs so we went to like a glass a glass blower and like pottery person um people who made harps for a living oh, wow yeah like That's a cool. cow farm we went to all these different places and we were like how do you see these aspects of the bible in your work like what is the creational goodness how do you see like brokenness because of the fall like just in your field and everything and how do you the one we spent the most time on was focusing and asking them, how do you bring, how does your work bring about redemption in the world? Hmm. It was just so cool. So I love that about One Life. I mean, then you got to travel all over the place. We went to the Navajo Nation in Arizona and New Mexico. Never knew which state we were in. We were like <laughs> right on the border. So we were always going back and forth. But it was really cool to have our idea of missions turned upside down. And our main goal in that trip was not, we're going to go there and fix something and help these people. Our main goal was, we're going to go and honor them and listen to them and just hear their story. Um, I really loved, I really loved that. That was super powerful for me. Going to Israel obviously was yeah, amazing. Was say, yeah. <laughs> yeah, getting to 
talk about the Bible and its geography. We took a Bible geography class. And then to go to Israel, like, oh, my it, gosh. Yeah. It was amazing. Yeah. Oh, I, I loved that. Just getting to just see everything. And it was incredible. The year we went, um, it's weird. Israel is actually a lot like my home in San Diego. They're, they're pretty much equidistant to the equator. Um, I mean, obviously, California, Israel, very different culturally. Yes, right. But amazingly, like, there were some areas where just the vegetation, like the plants and the yeah, weather. Delta, yeah. yeah. And so one thing that y'all don't know about here, <laughs> but has been something I grew up with was drought. And just mm-hmm. like Israel is very brown most of the time, just like just dusty. It's hard to grow things. They had had incredible rains. And so when we came, it was just this lush. There was just green everywhere. That's cool. And it was amazing. We w- went to see what was thought to be maybe the like the Valley of the Shadow of Death. Um, and seeing that and just that barrenness and like dry, but then looking right outside of it and there's just green everywhere was so cool, so powerful. Wild. Yeah. Um, so did you ever get a chance to like engage in like the music culture of those areas at all? Not nearly as much as I would have liked to. Mm. Um, yeah, and again, at that point... I know point, it's more Bible-focused anyway, so... Right, more Bible-focused. I wasn't even sure that I wanted to do music. I was actually kind of opposed to the idea of majoring in music, which is a whole other thing. But, yeah, I mean, so in Israel, it was... There was so much to see that mm-hmm. we were just running from place to place. We didn't really get to stop and listen yeah to some of the culture and everything um in the navajo reservation it was fascinating one thing that they talk about an attention that we saw Mm -hmm. in while we were there and we were really learning about is native american culture is really kind of a dying culture i mean yeah they they're losing a lot of what made their culture theirs And so one of the ways that we saw that is in like our worship conferences that we got to go to with some of the youth and everything, they really had predominantly American music that was playing. It was kind of this tension of the older ones clinging to and holding on to their culture and some of the younger generation just being torn of wanting to respect that, but feeling like America is kind of their for- first culture, but the, right. like neither like, one. Like the assimilation yeah. to Americanism. Yeah. That's, that's so, it's weird. It to think is. About. Yeah. yeah, and it, w- it was heartbreaking, honestly, because, mm-hmm. yeah, I remember one of the teachers asked, we visited some high schools, and so one of the teachers at this high school brought a girl in and was interviewing her and asking her some questions, and he said, oh, would you say you're more... American or Navajo. She's like, oh, no, definitely more Navajo. And he said, well, if someone you loved was sick, would you first go to a medicine man or a hospital? And you could just see, like, she was trying to smile and keep it. Yeah, I don't know. But you could just kind of see the devastation of, like, I choose a hospital, but that, like, killed her to say that. Yeah, it was really Mm -hmm. interesting. It was sad, which... Isn't related to music, but it was really cool. Oh well, it's I mean it's 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 an experience for sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and I've def- definitely listened to that music as much as I can now. Like even just through YouTube, as goofy as it sounds and stuff mm-hmm. like that. But yeah, it, that, ethnomusicology is so fascinating. Yeah, I mean, in, it, it sounds goofy to say like search it up on YouTube, but that's literally how some of those cultures survive. Is right is through posting their videos. Because the way most, uh, at least tribal, like in the mm-hmm. in the purest form of the sense, uh, music survives is by the older generations passing it on to the newer generations. Right. And that in this increasingly more te- technological world and more yes. yeah. globalized world, it, we're losing a lot of the uh, special things from mm-hmm. you know from the tribes. Whereas, yes. like whether it be here in America or abroad. Mm-hmm. Lo- it's losing a lot of texture because everything's becoming so popular. Everyone's becoming so integrated. Yeah. And um, it's much more addicting to be when in the popular culture than in the traditional uh, 
traditional tribal ways. Right. Yes. <laughs> in yeah. some ways, it's much more easier to live in, in this world than their oh, traditional sure. world. Yeah. Because it's surrounding them. I right. Mean, yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's not, it can't be in nomads when, you know, there's cities. Right. Yeah. <laughs> roads blocking you. Yeah. And when people say, no, we're America and we need to govern you to some extent. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They just don't have. Yeah. It's, it's hard. It's sad. But. So an another hard, sad thing, <laughs> possibly. Um, yeah. You have scoliosis. I do. Yes. How, how has that affected your playing? Yeah. I mean, it's affected me in a lot of ways because um, I know that the reason when I was 15 that I had to stop playing violin, I mean, some of the reasons, there were other things going on, but one of the reasons was, um, so scoliosis, they call, however, like swoopy your mm -hmm. back is, <laughs> they call that your curvature. Mm -hmm. And so um, within a year, the degree of my curvature, they they make a straight line and then they compare, like they figure out what the angle is between a straight line and what your back is doing. Um, and so they measure those by degrees. My curvature had tripled its number of degrees within one year just because I had a growth spurt. And oh, no. so that went from, oh, she has the tiniest bit. We think she maybe has scoliosis to, oh man, okay, what's going on? We need to stop this before this gets bad i mean i'm very blessed to have it very mildly um but even like singing is more difficult just because my ribs aren't aligned perfectly oh, wow. and so like breathing you get <laughs> i can kind of feel it more when i try to do those full breaths and everything for for singing and stuff like that so i mean it even began to impact me way back then when i lost a couple years of lessons because we had to figure that out um it definitely affects how much I can practice on any given day. There are some days that's like, I could go forever. And there are some days that the pain's just so bad that I'm like, I think I'm going to throw up. I think we're done with an hour today. Mm. Or, yeah, so I don't know. And I mean, an hour's still good. It's right, not yeah, my, an hour's <laughs> still like... It's not my goal. My goal right. is closer to three hours, but one hour is good. Three but hours. yeah, yeah. It, we're crazy. String players are crazy. You ask anyone. And <laughs> but yeah. And I mean, even again, some of that and the drive for me to practice as much as I possibly can is even knowing that I had a later start and I had interruptions mm. and stuff that it's this feeling of, oh, we need to play catch up and yeah. everything, you know. So, yeah, it definitely it definitely affects me just in that doing what I love hurts sometimes. <laughs> and it's like, shoot, I want to be here and I want to be present um some of the times where we have multiple concerts or we'll talk later about pit orchestras but mm -hmm. like when i was in pits and we were doing multiple shows a day it can be really taxing um uh it's also taught me awesome things about how to be okay when my best isn't 100 percent because as musicians we're perfectionists mm -hmm. and we're like no it has to be 110 percent especially when you're with those first chair violinists those oh heck <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's a reason i'm a violist <laughs> Violin is can be scary, <laughs> but being able to realize like no, my best is still okay. Like, mm -hmm. and even realizing that yes, God's given me music to steward, but He's also given me scoliosis to steward, and He's given me my own limits and everything. And so, um, even when putting down the in my vi viola earlier than I would have liked to, even when that feels irresponsible, going okay, wait, no, I'm stewarding other aspects of who God made me. And I think that is one thing that musicians can really tend to forget too, is we can get so focused in the music that we can sometimes forget the rest of Our life. who we are. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. That we, I've seen some musicians. I'm like, wow, they really lost being a whole being and completely gave themselves to music. And I want to give everything I can and do my best, but I, don't want to neglect the other aspects of my life that God's given me to steward mm -hmm. in favor of and in pursuit of music. And so it has, as weird as it sounded, it has helped me and my mindset a lot, even though it is like, a, oh, that's a bad thing to like feel pain and stuff like that. But it really has helped me just learn how to balance 
balance my limitations because Lord knows I do not like to be stopped and I do not like to go, Mm -hmm. maybe I can't do it. So it's been really good for me. It's really interesting how some disabilities help you rather than than hurt you. Yes. Uh, Meaning uh, in regards like growth. Yes. Um, So was it something you were born with, uh, scoliosis, or was it just something that Uh, just kind of So, yeah, so scoliosis typically first hits girls in like puberty and there's some they believe there might be some hormonal connections to scoliosis um but the main thing is it usually hits girls in their like later elementary to like preteen teen years and it really does progress and get worse as they grow so they didn't find my scoliosis till i think i was 14 mm. at all and i barely had it so yeah, talk about a weird, <laughs> it was just like a, we're going, everything's normal. And then at 14, it was, oh, hey, something's a little odd. And the next year it was, oh, wow, this is getting just a lot worse. And even right. like, yeah, yeah. I, I remember as a kid having to like bend over and like wait, wait for them to like count my spine and yep. and do all that kind of stuff. Yeah. But it, because I, I, I never, it, it's not genetic, is it? Is it just? Not that I'm aware of. I, so there I wonder, might be genetics, but I wonder I if uh, your lifestyle impacts whether or not you have scoliosis or not. Yeah, I really don't know. Yeah, again, because I know that we there are there's something about like girls, especially in kind of like my BMI and everything like that. Mm. Like that, I went to a scoliosis clinic, and most of them were girls about my age or within that age range of when i got it Mm. and they we all like looked like we could be siblings it was insane we were like what is this so i don't know if it is something about genetics again i think hormones have a lot to do with it but there's a lot one of the hard things about scoliosis is there's a lot they don't know so i i came in to see like an orthopedic um doctor the first time i had scoliosis and he basically said try running that'll make you stand up straight the next year i came he said if you want to schedule surgery you can otherwise take ibuprofen and that's pretty much the information that we have given to us and so it's it can be kind of challenging to go i don't even know too much about who like my own disability why it's happening what things are attributed to that or what things could be like a different yeah something else i don't know so it's it's that's almost the uncertainty is almost harder than right like the pain because you're just like wait what do i do with this it's it's kind of you have to learn and discover as you go but so what are some of the the remedies i guess uh for your scoliosis because i remember you had to wear a brace for a, a while yeah and i you know i'm technically supposed to wear that <laughs> you know i'm supposed right. to be walking in that like five hours a day um that's just again with a college schedule it's that's hard. just a lot yeah it, it wears out my clothes pretty quickly and everything it's su- it's, it's not breathable so you know there are some things that i'm like i want to again steward my health and do the best i can to some extent I also want to live life. Right, yeah, right. <laughs> and <laughs> yeah, so there there were a lot of things. So I mean, right now, um, I'm going to physical therapy, mostly for my hips, just because I've been getting a lot of more hip pain from being, um, just from having, yeah, being lopsided, having one side kind of be weaker than the other and everything like that. And so definitely like exercises, figuring out what exercises are good and which ones aren't helpful i later mm. found out that running is actually pretty bad for scoliosis because yeah yeah it doesn't make sense because it's impact trauma. yeah it's a lot impact, of impact trauma. Yeah. yeah and it's the gravity right. you're constantly coming up and then gravity is pulling you back down and, and that's just shifting yourself all over the place right and that's kind of compounding your back and yep. yeah so, so probably a, lo- a lot of resistance training yeah there's some resistance training a lot of it is core work Mm-hmm. And the more you work your core, the more and muscles, the more it can support. So they say my physical therapist and everyone that I've met with is like, your skeleton is your skeleton. It's mm-hmm. wacky and there's not much we can do about that. Um, but 
your muscles are your support system. The right. more you can really work on those and everything, the more um, you'll be able to move and everything. There's ice, there's heat, there's ibuprofen. There, there are exercises um, like... The bike biking is great. That's something that's really low pressure kind of mm. and everything, but it just gets you moving and stuff like that. Um, so yeah, they're staying healthy and strengthening muscles, which I don't do near as much as I should, <laughs> but that's something I'm focusing on more this summer. Those kinds of things really help. And even that's part of stewarding my music well is mm-hmm. making sure that that's probably building a lot of endurance for you. Yeah, wow. for sure. Yeah. Well, and if I'm not taking care of my body, I play my instrument with my arms and I have to have that posture mm-hmm. and everything that, yeah, being able to see taking care of your health as part of taking care of your instrument and your performance right. too. Because a large, I mean, a large, everyone says that if for singers, the body is the instrument, but for really yes. it's for everyone. It, your body is your instrument because the instrument's yes. not going to play itself. Exactly. Yeah. And definitely, I mean, you're using the like the air is coming through you as you're a mm-hmm. singer and everything. But yeah, to some extent, everything. I mean, you have to have that finger like motor Dexterity. skills and everything. Yep. Yeah, you gotta and have the lung support for anything breathing for for any air instrument. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, for piano, like finger dexterity for drumming, you have to have your whole entire body coordinated. Exactly. Yes. <laughs> yep. It's a lot. It's a. It's... It is a lot. Well, and even one thing you don't think about, but for string players, I mean, I'm really grateful because my teacher and I usually sit down during lessons, which is really helpful for me because standing up that long and especially just right. being in the same position is exhausting with scoliosis just because everything's creaky and not being able to move, trying to stay in one position can be really exhausting and especially standing up I find. So it's nice to know that like sitting down is an option and stuff, but yeah, it's just, it's a lot. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's so interesting that you mentioned the core because I have a lot of back problems as well from having to, yeah. uh, not that I have scoliosis or anything, but from, I marched the glockenspiel in high school. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Yeah. So in, oh, dang. in <laughs> high school, they don't really care about your health as much as right. I, I think they should. They think um, you're immortal. They think you're immortal. <laughs> and to some extent, kids are, they can they're bounce back. very yeah. They're, it's a little bit, but after a while, four really years does. of it, yeah. it's going to leave its mark. And uh, I found out that it's one of my sides, but it's it's either my lower side is twisted to the right mm-hmm. and my upper side is twisted to the left or it's vice versa. Oh, uh, yeah. So I'm like, like always like sitting kind of like this almost in, yeah. my, in my spine. So it's a lot of... Um, I get a lot of back pain because my core mm-hmm. muscles aren't aren't strong enough to support the rest of my body. Yes. So, yep. <laughs> so it's a, it, even even so even now um having to take care of your back is probably one of the most important things you could ever do for yourself. Right. Well, and especially not to be too much of a downer, but knowing that this is even the best it's probably going to be because right. you're only going to get older. And hey, I'll tell you what, there are also benefits to keeping that up and taking care of yourself now. Because I get to win plank competitions anytime we have them. So I'll tell you, it has its benefits. Mackenzie knows. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, even then, it's 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 just taking care of yourself. And, yes. And yeah. I, there's so many people that are against exercising, but you're going to feel better. Yes. Even if it hurts more in the short term. It's the long term gains that you got to think about. Because when, yes. when you're like 60 or something, you're you're think about your back and how it feels now. Mm-hmm. Think about when you're 16, you can like hardly bend over, you know what right. I mean? Right, yes. Yeah, it's like, <laughs> this is the only chance you get, and this is the time when you get to take care of things. And that, yeah, there's no, there's yeah. no, there's little remedy when you're older to recourse yourself. So it's it's all the work you do now that yes. is going to make it so that way you can actually bend down and pick something up when you're 60 years old. I met a guy that was 65 something. Yeah. And he he was a he was he was a, a wired dude, he, he electrician kind of dude. Yeah. And uh he he was granted he was smaller, but he could go under my desk, crunch up like a ball and like sit like yeah. that and do all sorts of things and he was moving all sorts of ways that that I thought would be like Oh my gosh. I thought he was at least uh 30 40 the way he was moving right but he was like no all i'm doing all he was he, was, he told me the three stretches he does and now i do them all the time yes. he, he literally just bends down and touches toes at, in the morning that's, oh yeah he does that 
And then he, he laying down, he puts one leg over the other. Uh-huh. Uh, so if I put my right leg over my left leg and yeah. then uh, bend over to yes. my to my right, it, mm-hmm. it that's going to um, loosen up your back. And even I just did that just sitting now. I was just like, wow. I just, You're like, wow. I, I, uh, there was a little bit of tension on my back. And it's, yep. <laughs> and you'll feel it. And it's like, wow. It would be yeah. cool to have. Because I, I remember having that range of mobility when I, I, I played right. soccer and all that jazz. And I was yeah. like, it, felt, it feels really nice to be able to to. Uh, not only like bend over and pick something up, so that way right. I don't have to like, get on my knees and actually grab something. Yes. So it, and it just, it's always. I feel like people think that exercise is a lot more work than it actually can be. Right. Yeah. And figuring out like, you can, exercise is so broad that you can figure out what works for you too. Oh, exactly. Yeah. And I think one thing too that, man, God's been teaching me in so many different areas in life is this balance between contentment and advocacy. Mm. And so I think there are two ways, two extremes we can tend to lean is lacking contentment and advocacy of going, I don't like this. I wish my health was better. I'm just so frustrated about this. And then not doing anything. Right. That, yeah, it's like it's... And then you can either just say, oh, well... I'm just going to give up and you're faking contentment, Mm -hmm. but there's no advocacy and that doesn't do anyone any good. No. And then there's advocating, but never being content and going, no, this isn't good enough. No, I need to keep going. And I think there's this level of, so with my health specifically being like, okay, this is the body God's given me. And these are limitations he's given me. And I'm okay with that. Having said that, I'm not just going to give up and go, oh, well, so I'm just not going to do anything. Like, I'm going to fight for that. I'm going to advocate for it. And it's not like in God's plan that he gives you the ability to be better. You know what I mean? It's not like that. Yes. Because you're always always in a season of change no matter what you think about it. Exactly. And the the time to change is now if you're you're going to do it. It's just just building up that comp. Like, for you saying, find out what works for you. I hate running. Oh, same here. I, I tried. I, I really I, tried. Right. I loved <laughs> running. When, right. I loved running when I was a kid in, in soccer all the time because that's literally all you do. You run around and yeah. it felt great. Matt Cross loves running. Good I don't, for him. Matt yeah. Cross is amazing. <laughs> Good for him. Right. Exactly. He loves to run. And it, it, but for me, it's swimming. I love to swim. Nice. Yeah. And that will exercise all parts of your body, no matter what you're feeling. Yes. Um, but, um, even now I'm thinking about getting just a, 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 a resistance band. And so, yes. and then whenever I watch like the new Kenobi show or a yeah. new Star Wars or whatever, yep. or what I'm, tr- what I'm going to watch soul tonight later on nice. uh, for the first time ever. I haven't really? Seen... Oh I my know. gosh. You are not ready. I oh, know. it's so good. I, <laughs> I first of all, I know that that's a sin for me not watching a Pixar hey, movie. There's it's, grace. It's, I know, I know, <laughs> but I, but I, people give me so much trash for oh for not gosh. seeing Soul as you know the person that I am. Right. Um, yeah. But I've been wanting to see. I just never. No I worries. <laughs> you know, I never Bro, had, I get you never you. find the time to to watch movies anymore. Exactly. People, people are like, you've never seen the Lord of the Rings movies? Like, I don't have twelve oh, hours. Oh man. <laughs> yeah, Lord of the Rings. That one is way more, it's it's great, but it's much more understandable if people can't see Lord of the Rings because they're just long. They're just long. They're so good. They're so they're good. So yeah, good. I've seen the so first long. two. Okay, I'm nice. trying to see this, the, th- the well, third hey, one later on. Yeah, I'm getting there. Okay, yeah, and don't let people give you crap because, hey, you're working on it. Right, I'm working on it. And you've it. got your timeline, and that's okay, but, oh, man, you're going to love Soul. It's so good. I know. I, I've uh, I've been told I'm going to cry, and I've already, oh, yes. ex- I already expected that knowing it's a Pixar movie. Oh, yeah. About oh, it's- music. Yes. It's going to make you cry. Oh, yeah. Um, Absolutely. But Pixar yeah, just, in general. Always right, make you cry. Right, <laughs> exactly. Um, no matter if it's Finding Nemo. Or, oh, my gosh. Um, and Up. And Oh, yes. <sighs> okay, anyway, so. talk about anyway. impactful songs. Oh, my um, gosh. Right. Uh, but, yeah, going back to the resistance train, like, just yeah. figuring out, just finding mindless ways of doing exercise. Yes. Um, for like i like to shake my knee a lot as well even that's some yeah. sort some sort of exercise it's just movement if just taking movement. a walk i love taking walks just getting to see something that's beautiful outside mm-hmm. and go we're just gonna enjoy like you're moving it doesn't have to be strength stuff it can right. be just stretches a little bit of cardio is always good cardio is definitely my least favorite but like it's good for you. Yeah, car, <laughs> but, car, I'm always being told if you want to lose weight, do cardio, and I'm like, uh, but 
<laughs> but it hurts. <laughs> but, right, it's, yeah, like, but... it's stressful, man. Yeah. And um, so it's just been learning. Okay, if I'm gonna, if I'm gonna listen to music, I can listen to music and work out. Yes. And yeah. so it's also just keeping your mind off of it as well. It's it's part yes. of my because I hate sweating. Right. And I don't know oh, anybody. Who, I don't know anybody who likes sweating particularly. Right. But, but like it drives you batty. You're it, like I'm not okay now. Yeah. Well, yeah. No, like, and it's just a, a negative reinforcement. It's like, well, yes. I already took my shower today. <laughs> right. I don't want another one. Right. You're like no. <laughs> right. Exactly. Yeah. So, uh, but it's so important, yes. especially like um when you have like injuries because you can make so many injuries when you do music. Oh yeah, There's so many injuries. I uh one of my, one of the previous guests I had on, uh, Liam said mm-hmm. he his pinky was messed up or not feeling right. Yeah, and, and he had thought, oh maybe it's because my wrist or or my arm or something. Right. No, it was because his back was messed up from when he, he yes. does he he grooves his head like this and it's yeah. pinching a nerve and all the way to his pinky. Yes, which is insane. Which is insane. But go to chiropractors, everyone, because <laughs> yeah, those nerves everything in your body it's it comes back to it's your back bad, yeah. and that's that's another area where scoliosis again can be just a brat because right. i'll be like it hurts to walk or like my wrist is super sore it's because of my back mm-hmm. like what is that about but yeah yeah so definitely yeah getting getting in that positive reinforcement with those things and doing things you love while you work out and again even if you're just stretching and just making sure that you're moving your back if yoga is something that y'all feel like doesn't go against your convictions and that you're comfortable with like that's stretching that's breathing those things are good for you too like finding what works for you just so you're doing something (laughs) right exactly and and that can be even like a hobby like knitting i'm sure is a lot of technical motor skills as well yes yeah and even and uh, people might give me trash for this, but playing video games, it's right, yeah, it's, that's still fine motor skills. Granted, mm-hmm. you're not working the rest of your body, but right, <laughs> but if if you're like struggling with like fine motor skills and hand eye coordination, it's really good for hand eye coordination. If you didn't know that, yeah, uh, video games, it's it's incredible. Like, <laughs> I have bad eyesight, but because, but, 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 but because <laughs> I play, uh. I played video games as a kid. I have incredible hand-eye coordination. Yeah, um, that's awesome. And I and I'm really good at moving my fingers around because of hand-eye coordination because yes. of, of the video game stuff. Exactly helps you with piano. Right, yeah. it helps you with piano. <laughs> and um, but you're just finding out what works for you and, and creating a balance. Yes, is, absolutely is important. Yeah. Um, as a musician, how do you create balance with your Ooh. like work and your music and in school? Yeah. Um. First of all, it helps that music partially is school, mm-hmm. but... And partially work. Right, and partially work. It's also... I'm blessed. I'm the student worker for the music department. Mm-hmm. So I'm blessed in that there's a practice room right by my office kind of a thing. And so there are there are a lot of ways where I really have had it easier. And having said that, taking... 12 classes and ensembles and trying to work and you know (laughs) and be a student and all of that stuff practice everything I mean I again I dabble in a lot of instruments um (laughs) and so practicing multiple instruments getting all the classes done all of that is hard Mm -hmm. um for me one thing that is super important and everyone's gonna be like ah what is this but sabbath not doing any of those things I need one day where I say, ultimately, I'm not in control. God is. My worth lies in the fact that he has chosen me and created me and redeemed me, not in anything else that I'm doing. And he's given me limitations. I have to accept that. Right. And I have to accept that. And I also have to reset my perspective and make sure that I'm not kind of drifting. That So that's mm-hmm. Sabbath is my day to say, I'm stopping, even if, I mean, there was one day where I had a psychology final and it was split into three tests. So it wasn't a traditional test time. And I think it was the second psychology final. 
And it was it was a tricky class. There was a lot of reading, a lot of things to remember. And it was my Sabbath. And I went, oh, no, the class is mm. tomorrow at 8 a.m. And I had started to put together like a study guide, but I haven't studied. And it was my Sabbath and I had to go, okay, I'm sorry, Professor Shikara, but I had to say, you know what? I committed to resting before God and I'm not going to compromise that. So I had my Sabbath. I said, that's in your hands. I'm going to botch it. I will take the B or C or whatever I get <laughs> um, in, my, in this class because of that. That's on me. But I'm not going to compromise that. Got up in the morning, was quickly trying to read through everything, took the test. I think that was the highest score I received oh, wow. on a test. I think I got one or two questions wrong. God just blessed me. He was mm -hmm. like, it's not about how on top of things are you? How are all of these things? And especially as musicians and perfectionists and competitive, not competitive people by nature necessarily, but you're yeah, right. always being evaluated and compared yes. and everything. Um, I got so focused on that, that when I finally said, it's okay, God, I'm going to rest in you instead. And my faith is ultimately more important than me being the best student I can be, God said, by coming to me, you are going to be the best student you can be. And that was just so crazy. And there have also been times where things have fallen a little bit behind, obviously because of Sabbath and mm -hmm. stuff like that. So it's not all, oh, it's going to be so perfect and everything, but it's still worth it. Um, other things I do to balance, I mean, deadlines. <laughs> yeah, right. I, I go by, okay, what is my next if I'm sitting there, I'm like, I really need to practice viola today, but this percussion ensemble thing is coming sooner than my next like orchestra practice or something. I'll set down the viola and I'll prioritize that mm -hmm. um, de deadlines, due dates for courses and stuff like that. So yeah, I don't know. Those kinds of things, sometimes you have to compromise. Sometimes you just can't do everything and it's going to be a... I'm doing my best, and so I'm going to do my best in these things. I have to figure out which one's going to not quite measure up, and there's right. grace in that. Right. So um, as a violist, you have played many piece, many a piece. Yes. You want to talk about And we have some of those pieces. Yeah. You want, you want to talk about it? Sure. Yeah. So I have um, – I kind of have two different pieces. I don't know which ones we're going to – We're going to talk gonna, about the Bach piece. The Bach piece. Awesome. So um, – I have been playing and getting to know the Bach cello suite, specifically the third suite, which is in C major. Um, this is the Courant movement. And this movement, it clicked with me right away. I was like, I love this piece. This is awesome. Um, it's been a really interesting and challenging piece to work on, mm. just in general, being unaccompanied and, um, yeah, trying to figure out, like, how to keep – rhythm and phrasing but also with Bach it's almost a little bit more free-flowing and how do you keep that musicality mm -hmm. in there while still staying true to everything so it's a piece I've really enjoyed playing it's for viola it's also not perfect there's gonna be right. mistakes there are gonna be times where I had to mess up and start again I was even considering trying to retake this morning and go well, maybe I should play again but it's like you know what it's it's not perfect and that's okay I mm -hmm. think we want to be seen as perfect and we want to only put out our best performances and sometimes it's okay to show the journey and just the progress so so any performance isn't going to be perfect either exactly um, and you shouldn't take this to be like oh sarah's making excuses but because she's not <laughs> uh sarah is an amazing violist oh, um, thanks. Well, i mean you've performed in my in my stuff and yeah. had it to the T. We're going to talk about that a little bit later. But yeah. right now we're going to hear, uh, and you recorded it this morning, you said. Not this one. This was recorded a little bit back. I was oh, considering God. recording again this morning. But I was like, you know, That's we're okay. going to enjoy. We're just going to show them the process and the the imperfect. So Cool. So yeah. this is uh, Sarah Ziegler's rendition of Bach Cello, Box Cello Suite number three? Yep. The Courant. The Courant. No, it didn't start from the beginning, so we're going to restart it, didn't, it from the and beginning. And you know, that's okay. And that's okay. <laughs> I got to. Here we go. Boom. There it is. 
So um, you also compose. I do. Yes, I'm dabbling in it. Mm-hmm. Yes. <laughs> so what what has it been like for you to compose? Uh, do you just create stuff, or do you have to find like reference material, or what? I definitely find a lot of inspirations in there. I don't know if there's one that you're looking at. Returning home. Returning home. Um, yeah. is. A harp composition I made for an orchestration class. Um, we were getting to know each of the individual instrument families and everything. And mm-hmm. so this inspiration was very vaguely um, remember me from Coco. Uh, yeah, it was the first time I had heard a major one moving to a minor fourth, and I loved it. And so I just kind of played with that. So yeah. Cool. Um, did you have that live performed? I did not. That is logic, believe it or not. Sorry. Oh, um, no worries. Uh, that was thought I was logic. Yeah, okay. which is literally insane. Right, I was like, yeah. how? Yeah. I didn't know if you had a... Remember Caroline Haynes? <gasps> okay, I think I met her for Ruth, maybe. Um, Because she came for the pit orchestra of Ruth. But yeah. I don't think I ever met her before. I would love to hear it played by an actual harp. That would be so cool. Right. Yeah, I'll, I wonder what she's up to. Yeah. Check out. Uh, so you have another piece. It's called um, 
like a Christ? Like a child. Like a child. <laughs> I, I was like, my, my answer like, like it's, it's a C-H. <laughs> I was like, yeah, C-H with an I in there, you know. Right. Um, like a child, I honestly have no memory of what the inspiration was for this. I was just really excited to... It's a mallet piece. Yeah, I love mallets. I got to know mallets over the last couple of years in um, percussion ensemble. I had never touched them before that, and I... Love them. So when we got to write a mallet piece, it's a mallet duet. And so I wrote it for vibraphone and um, marimba. Hmm. So, yeah. Well, with that said, this is like a child. Was that also using Logic? That was. Now, that one I would love sometime to record mm -hmm. with the live instruments. But, yeah, that was Logic as well. So, so well, this we're going to have to run out our radio time. So, Sarah, where, yeah. where can people find you? Like, find you on Instagram, Facebook? or Yeah, so I've got um, a website, again, all for one, strings, and... All four is the number, and then one is spelled out. So sorry to make it confusing. Um, I am working on social medias. I'm just kind of taking off with that right now. Um, but yeah, so you can find me on that. I mean, I my YouTube channel, I don't even remember what it's called in all honesty, but it's linked to, I think it's just my name, Sarah Ziegler. That's um, Z-I-E. G L E R. Yes. Yeah. Great. And I post some of the stuff that I've been working on on that channel. So, yeah. Cool. So, with all that said, we're going to keep going on the Facebook Live. It, so, if you're on the radio and you keep listening to Sarah, we're going to talk about uh, her working on and getting gigs at, at Pitts and doing other stuff. She's been doing guitar stuff with yeah. uh, nursery homes, which has been pretty cool. Yeah. She's also worked on some of my pieces. We're going to talk about that process yes. because it's. Uh, my pieces have been very interesting to perform. Oh, for sure. <laughs> um, so if you want to hear more about that, you can follow us on facebook.com forward slash the story Corey Rosen. That's C-O-R-Y-R-O-S-E-N. You can also search the story Corey Rosen on all streaming platforms and listen there. With all that said, I hope you guys on the radio have a great day. Nice. Cool. So um, me being a composer. Yes. <laughs> I have definitely needed my fair share of stringed instruments. Yes. Uh, for one of those pieces was the first time I've ever written for string, uh, str like a string quartet was Quartet Chaos. So much fun. <laughs> and the it was chaotic. Yeah, it was for sure. It, so th I I had been watching a lot of uh pieces. Oh, I forget the Rainer uh something Rainer. And mm -hmm. um, he is a conductor who loves to do orchestral, has a, like, like a lot of fun and jokes with, with the orchestra. Yes. Uh, so it's, and he's like, he's like, he's a comedian conductor. I think that's what. That's is, genius. Right. Yeah. That's amazing. I, so I really wish I had remembered his name. Yeah. Um, but uh, so the, I just wanted to do something like that. And Dr. Yeah. Gerlach was like, you should really like just write a classical piece. And I was like. I don't, want to. <laughs> I don't want to. I want to do something fun. <laughs> right. And um, so I started out doing that and I, I was like, how can I put in like silly jokes um, that people from like string instruments or orchestra would like understand? And then uh, so I started out with a very classical. It starts out very classical esque. Yes. Um, and then but then it's turned slowly turns into chaos. Uh, <laughs> um, someone gets smacked with a bell. I remember oh, yes. that. If someone takes away uh, someone else's bow. There's I'm playing little... like this at one point. Yeah, there's there's this crazy playing that uh, I, 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 I talked to Adeline and I was like, yeah. what is one way you can play violin that just is, is just wrong? <laughs> and, and, she, and she was like, maybe like this. But then, but then I was like, what if we put your arm around your head? 
and and then, and then we, we we she she did it all amazingly, and I was like, you know, what? it'd be fitting for a, a violist. The violist has to. The has to. Right? Yeah, right. <laughs> so we, we we put together this uh, quartet chaos, and it's. I thought it was a lot of fun. It was so much fun. It was a funny, really funny story. Uh, we we did a like a, a pre screening to oh, see yeah. <laughs> to see if anyone would like it. <laughs> And the people who showed up just didn't laugh. They were stoic. They were just glaring at us afterwards. We were like, did they hate was it? it? Was it, was it funny? Was, uh, am I just... We were so scared. But, yeah. For, for, uh, and then, but thank God that <gasps> everyone at the uh, actual like recital, they bust they out. They were dying. dying. Yeah. yeah, it was amazing. So what was the process like for you having to learn? Because uh, there's, there's a time, I think it's you, that plays off. Yes. Oh yeah. my gosh. Yes. So I had to play. Um, I had to play. I think I was supposed because to be an eighth, eighth behind. behind yeah. Because and it was supposed to be. Um, you were just that I was just not paying, not attention. paying attention. I was right. like do 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 and everything. Um, and so that was one really fun aspect about the song was playing things in a really non traditional way. That was incredibly hard. And I think it was hard for me because I was trying to stay off and everything in me was like, okay, I'm trying to stay off correctly. So when you're trying to get it right, but in order to get it right, you have to get it wrong. Mm -hmm. For me, it had to be almost a little bit more like, okay, that's about what I'm doing. But as long as I'm off, like almost more important to mess up. Yes. And... Make sure I stay off and then just know when I need to be back in mm-hmm. kind of a thing. It was also hard because I was throwing off. I think the violin one that I was yeah, playing off, throwing of. off. Yeah. So there are some times that I was needing to mess up even more because she was trying to come back to my <laughs> level. So it was definitely it was definitely interesting. Yeah, that that, that had to be a master class and just f- oh, yeah. staying in your lane. Yes. Because in orchestra, you are pretty much kind of taught to be like, Okay, I've got to fit in with everybody else. Yes, uh, and everyone else has to fit in with the conductor. But for right. that piece, you had to literally stay in your own lane and not worry about what the other person was doing. Yes, and as yep. a, as a, as people who play strings, your ears are tuned to absolutely everything and oh, trying to make yeah. sure it's correct. Yes, so it, I'm sure that was almost a near impossible task for was, for Adeline, who was also really yes. really a stickler for that kind of stuff. Yeah, it was definitely challenging. Well, yeah, because um definitely working with Adeline and Lydia um and Ellie, and Ellie yep. yeah they all worked we've all been working on staying cohesive so there were times where we had to not be cohesive mm-hmm. there are also other things that were super non-traditional for strings that at first we even like told acting. Corey right like <laughs> acting which I mean for me was the easiest and I think it was fitting because not the easiest, but I enjoyed it the mm-hmm. most. I loved hamming it up and stuff. And as a viola, I kind of had the most freedom to do that. It was like, okay, during this part, since I'm just playing a, a classic like viola, just playing the tonic over and over, it's like quarter notes, I can look bored here. I can hide my face because I messed up now. And I love that part. But there were some things, even some techniques that were unique that at first, I remember even some yes. of us were like, Corey, you can't do this. And you were like, yeah, you can. And we tried and we're like, oh, you really can do this. Well, and so it didn't make them like, oh, now they're traditional. But it was so beneficial just to go, oh, my gosh. So how as a string player can I stretch what I'm used to? The sl- yeah. The oh, sliding, my gosh. Yeah. The double stop slides were quite a journey. <laughs> but when you stops, got it, but when you got it, though. It was, it was awesome. It was awesome. Oh, it was so cool. Yeah. And Corey was a great... You were great to collaborate with, too, because if it was like, oh, this is really, really hard, you were able to go, okay, well, well let's see how we can tweak it to keep the same mm. feeling but make it more doable. Well, man, yeah, the, the double stop slides were so hard and we had to work on them so long, but, man, by the end, they sounded, it sounded awesome. awesome. That yeah. was my favorite thing to play because I was like, oh, it was just so fun. It, that was one part because I, I had seen other people do it, so I knew it was possible. Yes. Oh, it, yeah. It was just the matter of getting your fingers used to that movement because right. classically, that's not – you don't do that. Exactly, That's, that's a no-no. Yeah. Yes. Um, it's very much a fiddle fiddle technique or like a, like a country folky technique. 
Yes. Uh, for sure. But um, yeah, there were so fun though. Oh, it was so much fun. And it, when you did it, like when, oh. when, it, when it finally hit, it was like, yeah! oh, it was it awesome. Sounded so good. Yes. Yeah. Well, and that's one thing that with string players, playing strings is incredibly challenging because intonation. Mm. I mean, you change by the tiniest fraction of a centimeter. Yeah. And you're working with microtones, and you have to thread of your finger. Right. Yeah. You can literally roll your finger over the tiniest bit, and it's a different microtone, but it sounds off. Mm -hmm. And so, training, oftentimes, like string players can be super rigid, so they can play what they play really well, but they don't stray from that. Right. So getting to play Mozart esque stuff at the beginning of Quartet Chaos. (laughs) Good gracious! Oh my word. (laughs) But then moving to like fiddling in blah, blah, da, 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 and mm-hmm. everything like and more bluesy style. Yeah, like blues and everything. Oh my word, it was really fun and it's valuable experience. That's something that string players, I think, would benefit by doing more because music is heading more in that direction, yes. in that improvisational and like country, blues, swing, jazzy. But we don't, we aren't being trained. We're being so strongly classically right. trained and not exposed to other stuff that improv is so important to learn how to do. Yeah, now that I think about it, the, the whole piece is kind of like a, a progression of time, actually. It really is. I wasn't thinking yeah. about that either, but yeah, you have different eras in there. Because it starts off like classical, uh, and then it gets like into romantic a little bit, and yes. then it hits into the the modern aspect. Yeah. And then by the end of it, it's completely atonal. Everyone's just playing everything. Every, everyone's, <laughs> yeah, so there's like four ma- main themes throughout the entire thing. Because yeah. I, I, I wanted to give everybody a spotlight. Which um, is so fun. So yeah. awesome. So uh, the main theme is... <laughs> it's very, very classical. Oh, so, so like, super to a T. Yes. Yeah, um, and um, I gave I can't remember the theme for for the violin too, but uh, for yours it was the blah blah ba da ba. Yeah. And um, for for Lydia it was it was the the baseline of uh. Yeah. Of of where she just did her own thing. Yeah. Kind of dun, 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 dun. Yeah, and it felt kind of jazz. It yeah, almost right. felt upright bass and jazz yeah. kind of. That was that was yeah. the goal. Yeah. Oh, it was awesome. And at the end, they all played their main themes and the over each other, and it was, it was chaotic. It was, it was so fun, though. Right. And, Man. Uh, and, and it ends off in a. In a I, I gotta find a recording of that. Yeah. Or I, I want to re-record like in like an actual like legit space. Yes. Oh my gosh. I feel like that'd be so much Sign fun. Sign me up. <laughs> yeah. Right. That's awesome. Yes. It was such a fun piece to play. It was really. It was a different experience. Like it was such a good experience to play it, and the acting with it was so fun. <laughs> yeah. It, it was a lot of fun to because uh, I already knew what I already knew um, the basics of what I kind of wanted. Uh, the the violin one is always is typically the the kind of stickler for uh, normalcy yes. and perfection <laughs> yes and and in uh, not to say that Adeline's like that but she embodies that perfectly she played it really well yeah. yes she, and just knowing her she she uh, she would she had no problem doing yes. that uh, the second second violinist is. Ellie Pettis. Ellie, yes. Uh, now she's Ellie Schultz. Ellie, that's oh, that's right. Oh my married. gosh, right? I know. I always forget. I'm like, wait, what? <laughs> um, but uh, she, she, she was like more kind of relaxed and like whatever. Yeah. And the violist is typically the butt of many string jokes. Oh, absolutely, they're amazing. Of just the, the goofy person who just always messes up. Or... So fun to play that part. I loved right. it. <laughs> and um, and then the cello. Which was it was it was I, I didn't know if Lydia could pull this off because she's very much a, a a violinist in that yes. she's very uptight about herself. She's not f- uptight about herself, but you know what I mean. She's she's incredibly talented. Incredibly and talented. She she has a sense of humor, but it's so it's so like it's hidden. Buried, it's buried. It's yeah, a treasure. When you find it, oh my yeah. word, she's amazing. She's hilarious. But yeah, and she is more introverted too. So it was mm-hmm. that like. Is this going to be enjoyable or is it going to be she's like, oh, what are we doing with this? Right. She nailed it. <laughs> she, she nailed it, yeah, because the she idea for awesome. her was was kind of like the bum, quote yeah, unquote. Yeah, just like, I'm here. 
I'll do my thing. Right. I'm just, I'm the, I'm just the typical bass player. Yep. I was just chilling out. <laughs> she did awesome. She was so good. <laughs> she did awesome. Yeah, it was it was really a learning experience to try to coordinate such chaos. I'll bet. Yeah. Well, because you had the chaos of the piece, and then you had the chaos of us learning the piece. And, like, trying different things. And, yeah. And uh, getting, getting things exactly right. Yes. Because it, it's... It's a hard thing to control that chaos because, right. at, like, um, I remember uh, that we had to coordinate looks between each other. Yes. Um, for like, for example, when when you were playing off, Lydia had to be like, yeah, and, she and had that, to go, that hey. and that would let you know, okay, now it's time to play back on. Right. And, yeah. Uh, that would be your cue to do that. Or uh, yes. when Ellie took took, whoopsie, that oh. smacked the smack the uh, microphone. <laughs> smack the mic. But when Ellie took away the violin. Uh, yeah. At the violin one oh, bow, bow. Yeah. that would be your cue to do something or be someone else's cue to, like to do hold, something else. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Lots of cues and trying to, ooh, now I hit the <laughs> mic. It's just a trend. And trying to time that so you weren't like, exactly oh within my the music. Gosh. Yeah. Yes, yeah. Um, it was awesome and I'm really happy so it paid fun. off. It paid off so well. Yeah, well, I'm glad that it, one of the cool things with collaborating is Everyone has their idea of how Bach should be played. Oh, absolutely. But, and usually they're different ideas. <laughs> <laughs> but with Corey, it was like, we can ask him and we can right. play something and say, hey, is this honoring how you wrote it? And it's a unique experience, especially for strings, because we don't usually play music of people who are alive still. <laughs> <laughs> so it was awesome to be like, nice. We get to ask Corey, like, what's the heart of this piece and how are you envisioning all these things? And then, Trying to do that justice, it's definitely pressure because it's like, man, I want to honor this. Right. And I want to bring like the full intention, but and it's also so exciting. It's so fun. And all, it was, it was, I'm sure it was frustrating for some people because I didn't know a lot about the strings in general. So this, right, this was very yeah. much an experimental piece for me trying to figure out, okay, what is possible with the strings? Right. H how do you coordinate down bows, up bows, and how do they sound different? And how do yeah. I incorporate that into a piece uh, right. that's, you know, supposed to be stupid? <laughs> right. <laughs> Which, man, it's your first string piece, though, too. I was shocked. I was like, oh, my gosh. And, I mean, there was I'm an amb ambitious some... person. Right. Well, with my compositions. So. And you and you do you're an ambitious person, but one who can follow it up. Mm -hmm. You know, like one who can who can also count the costs and go like, okay, make sure you actually have what you need to be prepared. So Right. Yeah, it was awesome. Yeah, and I remember learning so much about double stops because about the end the ending right. piece, the ending yeah. part of it was uh, Oh yeah. Double stops for everybody. <laughs> that one and, was rough. <laughs> yeah, that we one was there. rough to figure it figure out. And, yeah. Uh the chord progression wasn't the most forward either, <laughs> which is on purpose. But right, um, it was really interesting to figure out. Okay, if Adeline can't play this note, maybe I can put it over here, and she can play that note that the viola is playing. Right. It was a lot of learning about how to orchestrate four strings. Yes. So it was it was a great learning experience, and I'm glad everyone uh got to got to take part in that. Yeah, it was fun. Yeah. So, yeah. um. Going into playing with other people, yeah. Uh, how how do you find opportunities to go in the pit or to play yeah. outside of LBC? Yeah. So I mean, first off, I've been so crazy blessed by the opportunities at LBC. So both of the pit orchestras that I've had the opportunity to play with um, in LBC productions and I amazing musician french horn player so cool and she does a lot of the orchestra organization she reached out to each of the students so pit orchestra didn't fall under our orchestra credit mm -hmm. but she reached out to the musicians and said if you want to play it would be great for you guys and i mean it helps them because we're one less person they need to hire like we're getting the experience right. we're volunteers um and so it's just really beneficial, a symbiotic relationship. Mm -hmm. um, but, yeah, so I've really enjoyed um, pit orchestras. I mean, Ruth, I got to be in the first no. live pit orchestra oh, yeah, of a sight and sound show. Yeah. That Dr. Gerlach transcribed from ear. So, oh, my gosh, getting to work with one of my professors that closely and – realize like this is sight and sound people come to lancaster because of sight and sound it's big 
and getting to be kind of a part of it was the first History, time a sight yeah. and sound yeah it was the first time a sight and sound show had been performed by anyone outside of sight and sound mm -hmm. and we were the first live orchestra because usually they would play recordings amazing experience then the next one i did was singing in the rain awesome experience as well um because that was the first time i read like swing and jazz notated Mm. So it was hard, but it was such a cool experience. Oh my gosh, to play. It was playing a, a completely different genre of music and reading that notation and everything. So definitely challenging, but really, really fun. Um, other ways outside of the college that I've gotten involved, um, I'm trying to think through. I mean, I got involved at church even before I was a music major. So that's been awesome. And I actually have moved over by some really weird phenomenon. I don't know what happened, but we actually have three violists besides me at the Calvary Church Orchestra where I play. And right now mm. we only have one, one, two consistent cello players. So wow. I actually play cello in Calvary Orchestra now. <laughs> have I taken cello lessons? No. no. Someone taught me how to hold it right. And like how to do fingering, right? So they taught me form. And then I just, I'm practicing everything because I've, I've been given the tools to practice a string instrument. Yeah. And now that I've been taught the form and luckily the cello music at church is a little bit easier, more my level of what mm -hmm. I can handle. But yeah, so I've gotten to get involved through church and just through friends. Um, One of my friends, her sister was getting married and wanted string players so badly. And I had the opportunity to go and be a string player for her wedding. It was so That's fun cool. and awesome. I got to meet more musicians that way. It's all about connections, honestly. Oh, absolutely, 100%. All about connections. Oh, my gosh. And that's part of the reason why I'm running the podcast is so that people can, right. get, can learn other people within the craft and right. figure out who they can call if they if they ever need somebody. Like, you... um. Granted, it's rare that you need a violist, but if you need right. a violist, you gotta you gotta know a violist. Exactly, yeah, and even just a string player that knows other string other players string is helpful. Invaluable, yeah, yeah. Well, and, oh my gosh, even just in our time before sitting down and meeting here, you've given me how many names? Like three, four names of people that I want to get connected with now, mm -hmm. and yeah, it's just, it's huge. It makes all the difference in the world. Yeah. Um. So you also do guitar for a yes. nursing home. Yeah, that was an amazing opportunity. Um. Basically, this girl, um, Jeannie Lassiter, I love her. She's wonderful. She is a manager. I shouldn't say girl. She's an alumnus from LBC. I think twenty fifteen ish was when she graduated. Mm -hmm. She's a manager of the Lancaster County Senior Center. Law no. Excuse me, the Lancaster County Neighborhood Senior Center. Long name, so I always get it wrong. But she reached out to our department because she was an LBC alum, and she said, I'm working at the Senior Center. They love music. They desperately want a music program, and we have nothing. Would students be willing to come? And I said, I would love to do that. That's my heart for music is community music, music therapy, just mm -hmm. kind of music education and stuff, using it to connect with other people. And so I was so excited. I used it as one of my internships, but I'm going to keep going. I mean, I'm theoretically done with my internship, but I'm going every week now because that's my family. I love them there. They're awesome. So I got there and man, I'll tell you what, there have been a lot of challenges. Um, language barriers. Most of them are oh, Spanish really? speakers and b speak barely any English, English, no English at all. Some of them. So some of them I'll teach one person who does speak some English and they'll teach some of their friends using Spanish, um, teaching multiple people, multiple instruments at a time. So I have, um, usually I'm teaching two guitar and one piano at the same time <laughs> within the same wow. class. Uh, yeah. So it's a lot. It's crazy having no resources, needing to just find stuff, needing to find stuff that they understand, like cultural, how can I get songs that they want to play, that they want mm -hmm. to learn so I've been learning Spanish songs, which is so much fun, but... The Hispanic songs are awesome. They're so beautiful. Oh my gosh, there's this one guy there who knows how to do finger-picking guitar. Flamenco? Like, 
Oh, it's, yeah. Anytime he comes in, I'll go like, oh, you have to play. He's like, no, no, no. But then he'll pick it up and he just plays it. I'm in awe. I'm like, you should be teaching us. Oh, my gosh. He's amazing. So it's definitely challenging, but I would not trade it for anything in the world. I mean, I've definitely had to redefine how I view success <laughs> yes. because sometimes, oh my, oh my gosh. Yeah. Sometimes in that lesson, success doesn't look like them getting Doing the music. Anything, right. <laughs> sometimes it looks like the former Marine just telling me all about his days in the Marines right. and feeling like he can connect. And I even, I was trying to teach him. I'm like, ah, what, what could he learn? What would he like? Cause he's more, he likes jazz and stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, He's African American and deeply like loves that culture. I was like, oh my gosh, I I mean I'm a military brat, so I know all of the different um all the different branch like hymns. March, yeah, yeah. the marches, yeah. Yes. And so I taught him the Marine Corps hymn on the piano. Right, yeah. I was like in C in C major and he was he was playing one finger at a time. He wasn't really sure, but for me that can be a success. Right. And yeah, I don't know. It looks like teaching a tiny bit of time most of them it's a an impoverished area in the neighborhood too and so most of them have never taken a lesson in their life mm -hmm. so trying to teach the basic music concepts to them but also make it fun and engaging it's been very hard especially having not taken guitar lessons myself and not having taken piano lessons since i was 10 mm -hmm. unless you count piano lab piano lab counts piano lab, that's so i've taken counts. some piano lab but yeah Again, at a collegiate level, though, the, how do I teach the basics again? Right. So hard, but so good. I love them. They're hilarious. I've sung karaoke with them, <laughs> tried to sing You Are My Sunshine in Spanish. They're so kind. They're so supportive, and they're just so sweet. Getting to hear their stories is amazing. So that's really my heart for music, but mm. yeah. So uh, you also, besides speaking English, you also speak hand. Yes, speak <laughs> hand. <laughs> yep, yeah. So in that same semester where I was like, well, I'm done with high school. What do I do now? I took an American Sign Language 1 class. That's the extent to my education mm. as as far as American Sign Language goes. But I got plugged into Calvary Church here. I got plugged into their deaf ministry. So I sit with the deaf congregation there. I watch the interpretation I watch deaf YouTubers anytime I can. For me, it's about the culture and learning because I have no time to take more ASL classes right now. For me, it's about learning from the community and just watching. And I really love it because a lot of them, especially for deaf YouTubers, you're learning ASL and deaf culture. And so you're hearing their stories and it's not just look at this pretty language and this cool hand stuff I can do, but it's I'm hearing this person's life mm -hmm. and I'm learning more about that. And it's just such a unique, it's such a unique culture and it's so cool. What is deaf culture like? It's, it's really diverse, even just in of itself, because I, I figure, yeah, deaf culture is the only culture that is not primarily based upon a shared location, if mm -hmm. that makes sense. Well, it does make sense because, you know, it, there's not like deaf country. Right. You know what I'm yeah, everywhere deaf people else. people everywhere, yeah. Right, everywhere else. I mean, even coming here from California, totally different cultures just based off where we, where we grew up and where we live. Mm -hmm. But for them, yeah, you're not born deaf because you're born in one spot. And so some of them are deaf born to hearing parents some of them got cochlear implants that helped them hear somewhat and so some of them might basically be part of the hearing world but technically they're deaf too mm -hmm. um you have a huge depending on what their education was there's this oralism versus like teaching asl um of is it a lot of people disagree on is it more in person important to teach them to talk and lip read first or teach them asl first mm. and for a lot of hearing parents with deaf kids they'll choose hear like speech lip reading and all of that because it's easier. otherwise they have to learn the other language yeah. which a lot you'll hear and oralism is usually put pretty much seen synonymously with like 
racism and right, stuff. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because it's like they deny them. The right, effort. yes. So language, language acquisition happens from a very early age. And at a certain point, you lose that ability. Yep. And most of those kids are already beyond that point by the time they're finally taught ASL, if they're taught it at all. And then they have the rest of their education denied them until they can lip read right, and speak. And so, yeah, oralism is a huge, um, one of the big like debates is which one is better and everything. Um, but yeah, so it's, it's a really fascinating culture. It's a really, bl- it's a really honest culture. So there aren't <laughs> fancy ways of like saying things no, I, I don't doubt that because if yep. you're using your hands there's no way to like beat around the bush with using your hands i don't right. think so right there's a lot less imagery it's a very concept for concept language so mm-hmm. you're not going to have every english word translated into an asl word right um and the syntax is different and everything um but yeah it's just, it's a very honest culture and it's a very open culture which i really love because like with them you make sure you see everyone and say bye because otherwise you're like, where did they go? And it's hilarious. You'll announce, and this is even an aspect of deaf culture that sometimes slips into my own hearing, like the hearing mm-hmm. world. And it, it's awkward, but you know, it's okay. That one thing that they'll frequently do is they'll make an announcement. They'll say, hey, everyone, like I'm going to the toilet because everyone needs to know where everyone is. They're all looking out for each other. And so... Hey guys, All of those things. <laughs> yeah, yeah. If they've noticed that someone like looks like sick or it seems like they've gained weight or lost weight, they'll say like, hey, you're small. Why is that? Or like, hey, mm-hmm. like you look <laughs> awful. Like, why is that? Like they're just they care about each other and it's know. just blunt and it's honest. And so oh, that's kinda <laughs> funny though. It's hilarious, but oh my gosh, I love it. It's so sometimes it's refreshing. As someone who, like, so spoken languages did not come easily to me. I didn't speak until I was three. I had to go to speech therapy. I have sensory Mm. processing disorder. And so I actually couldn't, I had too many speech impediments because I couldn't understand how my, how I was supposed to be making the correct sounds until someone, like, put gloves on and moved my mouth around. Um... Yeah, so I had wow. to feel it. And then it only took them showing me once, and then I had it. But it's de- it can definitely be tricky and stuff. And sometimes... It's uncomfortable. I, oh, trust me. I'm glad I was like five when it happened. I don't remember it. <laughs> right. But, yeah, and poor them. I can't imagine. Um, but, yeah, that I had to actually feel it. And so spoken languages do not come easily to me for as much as I ramble and rant. <laughs> <laughs> but... They they are just uncomfy and stuff and all of that. How can I say this but be polite? And how can I make sure I'm not talking like too loud because I can raise my voice when I get excited and oh no, I stuttered or all of this. It's so refreshing to go into a place where everyone just embraces you. I fumble all over the place and they all just love me. They are my family. They're my church family and they adore me and I'll be signing totally wrong things, but they're like, good job, you're getting there. I'm like, better in sign language. <laughs> right, yep. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> the constant like, oh wait, that wasn't it. I meant this, but yeah, so they're just so inviting and I get to use my hands, which you see me. I well, already use my hands, hands, hands all, all the time. time. Yeah. yeah, so getting to use my hands, getting to be blunt, like I, I just love it. They're, they're really beautiful, incredibly strong, incredibly forgiving culture that I just admire so much. They're just amazing. Oh my gosh. They're all so, not to mention each individual person is just so sweet and kind. And yeah, getting the conversations I've had with them and the friendships I've built, they're amazing yeah so. it, it's crazy to me i i um once upon a time i went to the social security's office and oh, yeah. uh because sometimes i have to do that right um <laughs> there was a, a deaf person and the issue was they were also blind as well oh my gosh so, yeah so i i was i was incredibly like in trend i was like how is this person going to communicate it's right because like, it's yeah. like well because like, you can't see mm-hmm. so they can't see any sign language right they can't hear 
um, because they're deaf. Right. And yeah. they probably can't speak either because of those things combined. Yes. Yeah. So I, I was, I was, and she had someone with her. So I was, I was just, <laughs> I don't know if this was, this was rude or anything, but I was just genuinely curious. Like, yeah. how, how are they going to communicate? And so, um, whenever, uh, the person has something to say, they, they would reach out and then, um, once the person realized that they were reaching out, they would like grab their hands and then, uh, the the person the 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 deaf and blind person would then yeah. reach back and like do their sign language because they, so they yeah. knew sign language yeah I was, was like, it finger spelling probably I don't know. I think it was probably finger spelling because there's the alphabet and at least with like Helen Keller and some prior to that a lot of blind deaf people will once they know the alphabet they just finger spell everything so it's mm. like they're they're typing almost. Typing. Which blows my brain. Well, well, for 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 in this case, I don't think it was that because okay. it looked like legit sign language. Because so, huh. so what the what the blind and deaf person would do would then hold on to the per- other person's hands and they would oh. do sign language and so that's they would like, have to memorize the movement or something. Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, and I was like, Oh my gosh, that's so cool. That woman is probably way smarter oh than gosh. I am. I'm like, I'm. <laughs> is it insane? Yeah, just the things that they come to. Well, and. One thing that's been especially interesting, which, sorry, I, I get no, all over good. the place, all the rabbit trails. One quick caveat. Um, in general, like if deaf people are having a conversation in general, it would probably be considered like rude to stare. They also know that people are like interested in mm-hmm. everything. And so, yeah, but it, there is like, a oh, giving them their privacy when they're having a conversation. But like they're super understanding yeah, I was just of curious. That it's not like that, I can understand yeah. anything that, that was said at right. all. But I was yeah. just genuinely she, curious. She, I'm sure the interpreter didn't mind. And I mean, the blind and deaf was, individual at some point didn't too. know. But right, right. <laughs> she, she's not bothered by right. it. So, yeah. And, and it really depends on the person, too, that, yeah, a lot of that comes with, like, relationships and stuff. But, yeah, mm. they're, they're such a forgiving, like, we're stupid and they know it when it comes to their culture. And so they're super kind with us. They're like, oh, you're okay. No worries. You don't, you don't know. And so mm-hmm. they'll explain stuff. Um, and they just encourage other people. Like, don't worry about it. If you make mistakes, like explain things when people do have questions, we'll explain to you that kind of a thing. But one, one other interesting thing, just because again, like, so two of my main loves are American sign language and deaf culture and music, mm-hmm. which are just on different spectrums and stuff. But one thing that I love is deaf people will say like, no, we love music. We can totally interact with music. And one of the senses that we have that we've just numbed down because we don't need it is feeling those vibrations. vibrations, There's also a level of hearing impairment. I mean, one little girl at one point, I was helping out with kids. She ran up to me and she's like, when you take off your glasses, is it everything black? She thought I she thought that glasses and eye impairment <laughs> meant I was blind. And I was like, no. That's, so <laughs> That's not how it works. A lot of us have the same misconception about right. hearing. We all assume that if you're deaf, it sounds like complete silence oh, all the time. Yeah, right. Yeah. So but like so one of my friends, um, Miss Jody Lee, she's like she's like my aunt here. I love her. She's amazing. She's hard of hearing. Um significant hearing loss and everything, but she says, I love cellos. She can hear that lower mm-hmm. range easier. And so she can hear some of like the cellos and everything. So between rhythms and vibrations and then those wavelengths that you can hear. Yeah. Oh my gosh. People. Also, Beethoven, when he lost his hearing, he right. still wrote music and still played. Which is so crazy. It's yeah. amazing. Yeah. Which also one musician that you've got to hear about. She's incredible. She's one of my role models. Um, Evelyn Glennie. She is, oh man, I'm trying to remember if she's Australian. Um, She is an incredible professional percussionist and she's deaf. But she said, I want to learn percussion. And her teacher is like, how are you going to do that? She's like, the way other people learn (laughs) by experimenting with it. She takes off her shoes when she performs. She can feel everything. She's incredible. Evelyn Glennie, um... N N I'll, I'll I'll find it. N N I E, yeah. Um she oh my gosh, she's just incredible and she doesn't even 
her thing, it, her big thing isn't, oh, I'm a deaf musician. She's like, no, I'm a musician. She talks mm-hmm. about all kinds of things. In fact, she does um, a TED Talk. She doesn't even say the words, I'm deaf, in her entire talk. Is she, is she actually speaking? Yeah. Oh, oh she's wow. speaking okay. the whole time. And <laughs> it's you... kind of obvious. Is she sign language the entire time? Right. No, <laughs> she's speaking. You can't tell she's deaf by the oh, TED, wow. TED Talk. Yeah, she's amazing. And... In fact, I'm trying to remember there might have been a couple instances where it was like, oh, you can see that she like didn't notice some sort of like s- sound that happened or something like that. But other than that, you really can't tell. Um, and that's super. I was just watching for it. But yeah, she's just talking about music and then kind of mentions how like hearing was a challenge <laughs> in learning, but like mm-hmm. only briefly mentions it. It's just like, what on earth? So she's a huge role model of mine, but I've always wanted to experiment more with what would deaf music be like and mixing those vibrations and like beats and rhythms and like what would what would deaf music look like of those mixed with the visual of sign language? I've just I've always mm. wondered and felt like that's a field that could totally be like could totally just explode and be such an incredible art form. So stay tuned. <laughs> That'd be if interesting. I, if I figure out deaf music, I'll let you all know. <laughs> well, because, I mean, you'd have to have, like, insanely good speakers to, like, actually feel those vibrations. Right. And uh, Well, and that's why, yeah, I'm like, so how could I, how could I change, like, how could I make it so that Put in the, the best music ever. And try to feel the vibration. Right. right. Well, yeah, that's my plan. Is like if I ever do it, get to get a chance to experiment, I'm gonna block up my hearing as much as I can and rely as much as possible on the vibrations and stuff. And how can I write the music so that they can feel it, no matter what, mm-hmm. like their sound system is and everything. Yeah, I don't know. So it's a whole field to be discovered. But writing original music for, like, catering to a deaf audience and with that in mind is something I'm really excited about looking more into. Yeah, that'd be interesting. It's really only an idea and has been for a little bit. So if anything changes, I'll let you know. (laughs) Cool, man. We're kind of running out of time on on, on the podcast. Too much to talk about. Sorry about that. No, you're good. I got a few questions. Yeah, absolutely. Um, So being a Christian, what is worship to you? Oh my gosh. (laughs) Um, Dang, that's good. For me, worship is coming to God, whether you're empty-handed or whether you're bringing him music, a lesson, or like intellectual study, like whatever you're bringing to him, if art of some other form, painting or something, is it's, it's bringing something to God. And I think we tend to get so absorbed in, oh, like music and stuff is worship. And even the people say, well, it's not just music that's worship. We still say like everything can be worship, but we forget that what makes it worship is God is bringing it to God God, and that approaching him and nearness to him. That's the part that makes it worship. So just like everything can be worship, everything can be not Not worship. worship. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and so I think that for me, if that's hopefully kind of concise. No, that, yeah. I mean that's that's what it, uh, that's what kind of how I describe it. It's it's acting within the mindset of of acting like Christ. Yes. And doing all things in that mindset. Yeah. That's that's what worship is. If you're not doing that, it's not worship. Right. I can be playing Bach in the practice suite, and I might be worshiping more in that moment than if I'm leading a worship service and everyone's crying and the lights are amazing. Right. You know, like yeah. Yeah, it's all about the mindset. Yep. So um, what is one thing that you know now that you would wish you had known when you first started? <laughs> like, where do I start? Yeah. <laughs> oh, man. Um, I think I wish I had known that God had me where he had me for a reason. Mm. I think my first year, again, I was not planning on doing music. I was like, that's impractical. I don't just want to be trying to get into the best orchestras. I want to do a ministry. This doesn't give me money. Right. <laughs> and I'm like, how am I going to live? I need to be responsible. And God was like, no, music is what I have for you. And so one thing he 
put on my heart was anything not done in faith is sin. And so any choice I would make about my college career, I was only making the wrong choice if I wasn't making it in faith. And mm. the more I was sitting there, he was putting music on my heart to the point where it was like, music is the choice I can make in faith. I'm not sure I can make the other ones in faith, at least in God, they're kind of faith in me of mm -hmm. like, well, I love people, so I might be a good counselor and stuff like that. And so he was like, no, music is that choice. And man, the whole first year, I was just like, what am I doing here? What am I doing here? I sh I'm not a musician. I mm -hmm. shouldn't be here. Like I felt like I was in the wrong place. And the one thing that kept me going was, no, but I made this in faith. And even if I don't make it all the way through, which I'm only one more semester, so I think we're getting there. But even if I don't make it all the way through, God had me here for a reason, and that time wasn't wasted. Like, that time was obedience to him, mm -hmm. even if I feel like an idiot. And I think I just wish I had more faith in that because, man, I couldn't see all the things that I'm seeing now as I'm getting ready to leave college behind, all the opportunities, all the people I've met, all the instruments I've picked <laughs> up. I, I didn't see any of that. So I think I, I wish I had known... Yeah, no, Sarah, you can trust God. It's mm -hmm. okay. <laughs> but, cool. So, last question. Yeah. What are some of the biggest mistakes that you think other mus other artists here or elsewhere make? And Ooh. how do you think we can combat that? Dang. <laughs> biggest mistakes they make. Comparing to each other and feeling like threats to one another. Mm. Because, and I mean... So quick story, when I came in, I came in with Lydia Talbot, phenomenal viol violinist, phenomenal. She could have gotten into such better, like she could have been a Juilliard she student, really she could, could have, have been, been a Curtis yeah. student, she's phenomenal. And so since I was wrestling with this, with this like, oh, I shouldn't be here, I'm not good enough. Impossible, and I saw her, I was yeah. like, oh my gosh. Luckily, I had met her even before... So she's in Calvary Orchestra too. And there were some instances where I saw other people butting heads because one person was better than the other mm -hmm. or whatever. And they were like all frustrated. I was like, I don't want to be like that. And oh my gosh, may I just say, Lydia Talbot is the sweetest, most humble, just so kind. She, if I had gone, well, she's good. And I'm not happy with where I am, so I'm going to be mad and choose to see her as a threat. Right. I would have missed out on one of the most incredible friendships I've ever experienced. She is so kind. We are jokes. Like now when we play, we play duets together all the time. And whenever one of us messes up, usually me, let's be honest, because <laughs> I'm like, oh, what is that? Whenever we mess up, it's a joke. We're all laughing. We have so much fun. Like she, she's phenomenal. And just to see how hard she works and how good she is, like, she's a gift to me. She's taught me so much. And she's just such, a, such an incredible friend. And, like, we've had amazing conversations and everything. And so I think one big thing is people not seeing other artists as uniquely gifted individuals who God has a specific place for, just like he has a specific place for us. Mm -hmm. And that, like, God's not making us fight for things. He's, even if we're going for the same part and someone else gets a part and I don't, it's not because God made us fight for it. It's because God said, hey, that was a great opportunity for you to try, but this person needs this experience and I'm bringing you to this other experience. And so I think that's one huge one that you just miss out and you, you'll, you will hurt more. You will hurt other people and people are amazing. <laughs> yeah, it's it's like I came in I came in with Matt Cross as yes. and I was a percussion major and he's yes. just the percussion professional. He's amazing. <laughs> yes, yeah. Um so it was it was really hard to uh, I felt I wasn't mad at him because No, you love the person right, but yeah, you're like, but just like why can't I be like that? Right. And then you realize because I'm someone because else. I'm not someone else. Yeah. And I get to do other things and yeah, like we can balance each other. And again, friends shouldn't look exactly the same and yeah, I wouldn't trade my friendship with Lydia for anything in the world. She's amazing. Yeah, and she's going to play in um in our orchestra concert. I think she's going to get to play a solo or a duet. I think they might be doing the, like, Symphonia Concertante by Mozart. So 
Go see it because you finally get to see her do a solo. I've been waiting for four years to see that? her get her solo. It's going to be this fall show okay. or the fall concert. So, oh my gosh, come support her. She's insane. <laughs> She's awesome. She's so good. Oh, well, yeah. all of a sudden, it's been a lot of fun. Yes, this has been so good. Thank you so much for having me. Sorry that there's just too much to talk about. And no, we, it's, it's totally... Took I think so much time. It was we, awesome. We hit a lot of the points we wanted to talk yes, about. Yes, yeah. So. And even some points that I'm glad we hit. Right. <laughs> so if you want to follow Sarah, you can find her on her website, uh, all for one. That is A L L, the number four, one O E, strings, S T R I N G dot com. You can find her there. Uh, you can find her. Uh, that there, that there, that's her email too. If you if she's yes. open to playing with other people. Oh, always. Always. Always want to meet more musicians and collab with them. Um, and so I'll, I'll actually be taking her out a few times to go yeah. out and, uh, and uh, make some music. But um, if you want to, if you have liked this episode, please be sure to like and subscribe, follow. You can follow us on all streaming platforms, on Spotify, on, on uh, Apple, on Google, if you use that for your podcast. Yeah. <laughs> um, the story, Corey Rosen, that's what you got to search. Nice. C-O-R-Y-R-O-S-E-N. It's the big neon sign with the red brick background. And with all that said, I hope you guys have a great one. What, blah, 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 great rest <laughs> yeah. of your day. And I'll see you guys later. Bye-bye.